Okay, guys. So let me reintroduce the subject matter of this lecture. And I'll repeat a few things I said before. As I mentioned at the end of the previous lecture, an economist doesn't consider a barrel of oil until it has a price. And that is the only thing that an economist cares about. Price transmits information about supply and demand. The information is needed to allocate scarce resources that, are, that have alternative uses. So as far as an economist is concerned, the price of oil, the, the, the barrel of oil is its price. It's the information that it communicates that allows you to make allocated decisions. But of course, we cannot be content with that. We also need to ask ourselves, why is a barrel of oil worth so much? What is the value of a barrel of oil? And of course, the answer is very easy. Oil is a store of energy. As I said before, all fossil fuels are basically corpses of animals and plants that were remineralized by bacteria and aerobic bacteria. That is, aerobic bacteria that do not use oxygen under special circumstances. All microorganisms remineralize large or organisms. Every corpse, even if it's buried on the surface or kind of lying on the surface of an ecosystem, microorganisms will disintegrate and reinject those nutrients back into the soil. But when that cor those corpses are buried under high pressures and temperatures without oxygen, they do not get to be reinjected into the into the soil and so accumulate and, form, and eventually form fossil fuels. So as I said before, this means that oil is basically solar energy. Solar energy that has been processed in many different ways. It would be a first photosynthesis, which is the first step, transforming electromagnetic radiation into chemical molecules that store energy, basically sugars, fructose, glucose, and a variety of other sugars. They are very potent energy storage devices, and that's what photosynthesis does. And that, at least for the case of terrestrial ecosystems, begins a food chain. Herbivores eat those plants, transform that into muscle, transform that into bone, transform that into a variety of other cell types. Carnivores eat the muscle, eat the fat of those, of those, uh, they, of those uh, uh, herbivores, and solar energy then circulates through a food chain. In reality, food chains are not this linear and this simple. They are more like food webs, given that there are animals that are omnivorous. They can, they can eat a whole variety of things. They can change their diet according to circumstances. Uh, and so when we actually plot the network uh, through which solar energy flows in an ecosystem, it might not be a simple chain, plants, herbivores, carnivores, but a much more complex food web. Nevertheless, the main point remains the same. In terrestrial ecosystems, as opposed to oceanic ones, where plankton is the main producer, in terrestrial ecosystems, green plants are the only primary producers. <coughs> they are the ones who capture their electromagnetic energy into chemical form, and therefore produce something that can sustain an ecosystem. Herbivores and carnivores are considered by ecologists as mere consumers. It doesn't mean that they are not significant, that they are not important. But in theory, we could do without them, while plants would still manage to, to survive, whereas without plants, they would not be terrestrial ecosystems. This is why when an ecologist charts the process through which an ecosystem puts itself together, the list of early colonizers, of second wave colonizers, of third wave colonizers, that is, the, the, the different stages of the process of succession, is basically stated in terms of plants. They are the primary producers, they are the, the, the basic machinery, energy converting and energy producing machinery of an ecosystem. And so the idea that we now want to explore is, relative to an ecosystem such as a temperate forest, and in the year 1000, which is the beginning of our story, and 
we drawing here are two little diagrams that I've been drawing uh, throughout the class. At the beginning of our story, the Roman Empire has been down, has collapsed for over you know, 500 years without the presence of the empire, without the presence of its troops, without the population growth that came with it. The forest that had already been destroyed by the Romans was allowed to grow again. 500 years is plenty of time for a forest to put itself back together. And a forest following basically these four steps had put itself back together in Europe. There were, of course, a few cities there, cities of Roman origin. Paris was of Roman origin. London is of Roman origin. Of course, most Italian cities already existed. But as we see from this curve, which as everybody remembers is the rate of urbanization in time, there's a big, intense upswing in the rate of urbanization between the year 1000 and 1300. Now, growth of cities implies growth of population. And growth of population can have a variety of causes. In this particular case, it was cheap food, which made if people have more families, availability of food made more infants survive into adulthood, population grew, therefore a small town, a small village, a little village could become a small town, a small town could become a medium-sized town, a medium-sized town could become a large town, and all those things are part of the rate of urbanization. So this upswing, like the second one, this one is of course caused by fossil fuel, coal, which begins to be mined in Europe in the early 1700s, but this first upswing is also caused by an, in, an intensification in, in the flow of energy through Europe, in particular the flow of energy in the form of food. What circulates through ecosystems is basically then flesh, flesh of vegetables eaten by herbivores, the flesh of herbivores eaten by carnivores. Ecologists probably think that the term flesh is a little too poor now, so they use a technical term for that, and that's the term we're going to be using, biomass. The circulation of biomass in ecosystems, that is the flow that we're going to be following tonight, <coughs> today, this afternoon. So what produced this upswing? Well, we're, we've already seen one factor, a commercial revolution the intensification of both the volume and regularity of trade between cities. Trade produces value, despite what Marx may have said. Trade produces value. There's such a thing as, as gains of matching complementary demands. Things that would go to waste otherwise get exchanged for things that are useful. There's an allocation of, 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 of goods that, that allows for a more even and more productive consumption of those goods, goods that would have gone to waste otherwise. So trade produces value. And part of what produced this upswing was the, the intensification of trade among urban centers that we already talked about. But a second cause was something that begins around the year 900 and goes to the year 1000, which is an agricultural revolution very humble by today's standards of big agro, and even humble by the standards of later on in the, in the millennium. It basically implied replacing cows as draft animals by horses. Horses had in fact much more muscular energy. In order to do that though, two inventions need to be created. The horseshoe, and which of course allowed for the hooves of the horses not to be worn down after work day after day of, of, of work in a farm, and the special harness that you needed in order to be able to tap into the muscular energy of the horses. A horseshoe, the horse harness, and then a very simple method of rotation. A, a piece of agricultural land was divided into two parts. One part was planted with food, the other plant was allowed to lay fallow, as they say, as the word, which means not planted at all. And I'm going, to, I'm going to describe what goes on in the fallow piece in a second, and then rotate it every year, every two years. That way you can, you can take better advantage of the nutrients in the soil. Those very simple innovations, horseshoe, horse harness, and a system of triennial rotation, increase enormously the amount of food available to Europeans, 
decrease the prices of food in marketplaces, more supply, the same demand means lower prices. People then began to plan for bigger families, the ones who, who did it planned at all, I mean, who actually did any kind of family planning at all, they could, they knew they could afford more kids given that the food was getting cheaper, but also many more kids with better diets survived into adulthood. So population grew. As population grew, that added another stimulus to the, to the growth of cities in addition to trade. But of course, if in the year 1000, we have a temperate forest that has to put, it back, put itself back together and surround cities on all sides with wolves and, 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 and bears roaming in the mountains, some wolves entering cities through the city gates. Well, then this intensification in the creation of cities imply an enormous deforestation. You need to deforest in order to create cities. As we will see in a second, by 1300, the deforestation had been so intense that uh, Europe faced its first ecological crisis of the millennium. By the time the bubonic plague hit in the 1340s, we were going to be talking about that on Monday, it found it, the, 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 the bacillus found it easier to transmit from one undernourished mass of people to the next undernourished mass of people. In other words, the ecological crisis due to deforestation had already provoked a crisis in, 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 in uh, food supplies and the bacillus for the plague, which would have stricken Europe very hard anyway, just found it easier to transmit itself through a bunch of people whose immune systems had been compromised by famines and things like that. So let me backtrack a little bit and just uh, speak of the, the process that had happened here in the years between the fall of the Roman Empire. And uh, at the beginning of our the period that we're studying here, an ecosystem, as I said, puts itself back together using several teams of plants. Plants working together with different characteristics that come in waves. When imagine a piece of land, a relatively large piece of land that had been just recently devastated by, say, a volcano, an earthquake, perhaps a flood. Uh, some natural disaster that destroyed the forest and basically left uh, just land. The very first plants that move in to recolonize that plant are plants with what is called opportunistic reproductive strategies. Opportunistic has moral overtones, we shouldn't see any here. It simply means plants that do not have to wait a year to reproduce. In other words, not animals, but plants that can reproduce throughout the year. Plants that can reproduce throughout the year are the perfect first colonizers when you have disturbed land, because there's nothing holding the soil together, and the very first plants that need to move in are plants that can reproduce as fast as they can. They have to wait a year for the flowers and the insects pollinating them and so on. Lichen and moss belong to that team of plants. The very first thing that occurs is the, is the, the assembling of underground food chains called a rhizosphere. A rhizosphere is what's under, underneath the ground. It's, the, the, it's an ecosystem, a very, very simple, microscopic ecosystem made out of mostly of plant, the roots of plants, of plants with opportunistic reproductive strategies, and the many the variants and the species of, of bacteria uh, and other microorganisms that have a symbiotic relationship with those, <coughs> with those roots. The rhizosphere is a necessary ingredient in any robust ecosystem. If given a, an empty piece of land, you come in and plant oaks, limes, elm, and beaches and to create a forest-looking thing, but what you've created is a garden, not an ecosystem. You probably won't have, you know, you will need to maintain it with a gardener and, and, and people who manicure it and so on, but it probably will not have the resilience of a real ecosystem. The resilience of a real ecosystem has to do with the fact that these teams of plants work together, one at a time, to, to integrate all the different components. 
So plants that don't have plants that can reproduce throughout the year are the first ones to move in. Their roots now stabilize the soil against erosion, particularly in inclined plants in slopes of more than 30 degrees, which are subject to erosion. Once that has happened, and once the rhizosphere has put itself together, scrubby birch, aspen, and other plants with now annual reproductive strategies can move in and share the ground with the others. Eventually, a pine forest can begin to form. And after that has formed, the final or climax vegetation in this particular case, it is like temperate forest, oak, limes, elm, beeches, they are the, the kinds of trees that, that belong to this climate forest, uh, they are able to then grow and thrive. And that's where the ecosystem stops evolving. That's why it's called the climate vegetation or the climate forest. Until another natural disaster strikes, at which point the entire succession process starts all, all over again. This Succession is what had happened before, between the fall of the Roman Empire and the year 1000, which is the beginning of our story. Then, deforestation began. In the first 300 years, most of the cities in Europe fed themselves from their immediate countrysides. As a general point, a point going beyond the, 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 the framework of this class, I do not believe that there is a single city in history, going back to early Chinese cities, early uh, Babylonian cities, early Egyptian cities, and so on, that has ever fed itself. In other words, cities have always been parasitic on the countryside. Cities have, all, cities have like vegetable gardens, and sometimes, you know, until relatively recent, you know, until about 200 years ago, you could have farm animals within a town but there was never enough food within the city to feed itself day to day. So it always needed some kind of supply zone. We already talked about that concept before. That is the zone, a geographical zone that supplies raw materials, in this case, food, in exchange for manufactured products, farm tools, uh, clothing, uh, the candles, and a few consumer products like beer back then it was almost impossible to drink water because it was always contaminated so people drank beer instead of so I drew here a little diagram that shows a town circa 1300 and we imagine it surrounded by its countryside which is a supply zone, as I'm drawn here, and I'm just giving you this. This is a calculation made by Fernand Brodel to just give you a ballpark figure to show you that there is, in fact, ways of quantifying this thing. In, in the year 1300, a town of about 3,000 people, which was a medium-sized town back then, needed 8.5 square kilometers of arable land around it, or equivalent, 10 rural villages to feed it. So there was a definite quantifiable need for land around the town. Most towns of the year 1300 fed from their immediate countryside. This is true of Florence, this is true of Paris, this is true of Milan, this is true of many of those landlocked capitals. The cities, many of the cities that inhabited the network system, Venice, Genoa, Amsterdam, <coughs> were in fact ecologically deprived from day one. They did not have land possessions, they did not have agricultural land. Venice was perhaps the worst of all in those terms. It was 10 or 15 islands or islets in a, in a lagoon. They had access to salt, they had access to timber, they had access to fish, as we saw, as we saw earlier in the morning. But, you know, you're not going to be able to be eating fish, and certainly not timber or salt. So they were condemned to trade from day one. They, they were not feeding themselves. They, were, they had to tap into slightly far their away supply zones. The same thing goes from Genoa. It was 
to this day is kind of cornered into a little sliver of a, of, a, of a beach by very high mountains with very inclined slopes, the kind of things that are on the terrace. You cannot really, you know, wait in one. You know? So Genoa was condemned to trade from day one. And the same thing with Amsterdam. Although the Dutch have always been particularly good at stealing land from the ocean, a kind of reclaiming land, and whatever shortcomings they had because of their geographical inheritance, they made up by engineering. Nevertheless, the Dutch cities tended not to be able to feed themselves either, and they tended to use whatever arable land they had for cash crops, and then buy their food. But with the exception of cities in the network system, the, the, the maritime metropolises that, we that we've been talking about, landlocked capitals were typically like that. And so this reproduced the same division of labor that we see in normal ecosystems. There's the consumers, and then there's the primary producers. Only in this case, whereas here, these are the primary producers, and the consumers are herbivore animals and carnivore animals. Here, the primary producers are not only plants, but plants plus farmers, or plants plus person. And the plants were, of course, not just any plant, but domesticated plants. Wheat, corn, barley, a variety of vegetables and fruits. But most importantly, for our purposes, the cereals. Now, a domesticated plant, just like a domesticated animal, simply a plant whose, whose genome, whose, whose genetic materials have come under human control through selective breeding. A very interesting exercise, and I'm sure you can find pictures of this in the net, is to compare a, a, a plant, corn plant or wheat plant from, say, 10,000 years ago when the Neolithic Revolution first began, that's when people began uh, settling down and, 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 and uh, practicing agriculture with, say, a corn cob from today, with this juicy, you know, with, with all the edible parts that it has. And a 10,000 year old corn seems almost like a joke. It's, 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 it has tiny little grains. You ever wonder how ever anyone ever fed off those uh, the corn cobs? The new corn cob has obviously redirected most of the biomass from the unedible parts, the leaves, the stems, the, the, the roots, to the humanly edible parts. So that is what domestication of plants does. It's a very slow selection of genes through selective breeding to redirect biomass from the unedible parts to the edible parts and to increase the size of the edible part, to increase the yield of harvests. So, those plants are obviously a, form a team or an assemblage with the farmers. Since without the farmers, you don't have the vigilance that you need in order for that process of selective breeding to produce those plants over 10,000 years. So if we're talking about a single entity, the farmers, with their tools, <laughs> Their horses with their horseshoes, or harness, and triennial their type of rotation, and domesticated plants, plants whose genes we had taken over. And that constituted the supply zone. So every city, in a way, casted an urban shadow around it, in which it inhibited the growth of other towns. There could be other towns over here, but they had to have their own supply zone. And so a city before the year 1300, that is before they began buying food in, in, in large quantities from far away, had to cast an urban shadow, had to create laws that made it impossible for anyone else to start a town in that area, and had to enforce those laws, those laws, if need be, militarily, so that cities kept their countryside dependent on them. They supply their countryside with <coughs> services, at the very least in the tiny little towns that we talked about, 
a marketplace for them to exchange their surplus of food for some clothing or some simple tools, and in the case of larger towns with other services, ecclesiastical services, medical services, uh, government services, and so on. But even though there was a, a, sort, a kind of symbiosis in that the town, depending on the countryside, the countryside so depending on the town, it was not exactly an even symbiosis. A countryside has always been dominated by the city, by, by a city, and a city that keeps it underdeveloped because it needs to keep it in the form of a supply zone. So the history of the millennium, that is the history of what happens in this curve, is the history of how supply zones began to, 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 to get farther and farther away from cities. If we began the millennium with the supply zone very close together, that is immediately at the end to the town, as we will see by 1500, the entire, almost all of Eastern Europe, that is almost all of Europe east of Poland, had become a supply zone for Western Europe. And eventually, past 1500, with the discovery of America and, and with the conquest of America, which, and, the, and the kind of taming of America that took a century or more to, to, to be implemented, then all of the continent, and including Australia and New Zealand, became supply zones for Europe. So that, that's the story that we're going to be telling today. But let me, before that, say a few more things about this time. Let's imagine that this is all forest. As I said, in order to create these empty pieces of land, this temperate forest had to be destroyed. The same process of urbanization that this upswing marks marks also a concomitant or a parallel process of deforestation. There was no other way all those little cities that were born, all those landlocked hierarchies that were born all over the place, had to be surrounded by the little countryside. So you had to take the forest away. <coughs> by 1300, a large proportion of the forest had gone away, and that was a problem, in particularly because, in particularly as I said, in slopes, because is the trees of, of, of is the roots of trees that hold the soil together, topsoil, and that is the second source of, of, of a, a materials for food. One source is solar energy, the other source is minerals that you find in the soil, particularly metals. Our DNA can produce proteins. Have the genetic code that can produce a whole variety of proteins like hemoglobin or, or, or any kind of you know enzymes to digest lactose and to digest this or that. But it cannot produce all the different metals out of which we are also made. When you look at, for instance, at a, at a, at a molecule of uh, hemoglobin, which is of course a protein that one of the main proteins in, in our blood, there is a floppy protein that's folded together. And then there's a smack in the middle of, a, of, a, of every molecule of hemoglobin, there's an atom of iron. Almost like a, like a Borg creature that's half human, half machine. It's like it's a combination of metal and floppy organic stuff. And it's that atom of iron right in the middle of hemoglobin that gives blood its red color. Now that's the most obvious type of metal that we have to ingest in order that we need to metallize ourselves in order for our blood to be able to transport oxygen thanks to the activity of that, of that single a, 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 a iron metal. But say our brain also works with metals. Substances like calcium, sodium, potassium, zinc, many of them, with exception of zinc, may not sound like metals to you, but if you had a large enough chunk of calcium, a large enough chunk of sodium, a large enough chunk of potassium, it would look shiny, it would gleam, it would go bing, when you bang it, it would be a metal, just like any other metals. And they are, of course, classified as metals in the periodic table of the elements. All of those metals, we need calcium for our bones, we need calcium for our brain, because metals transmit electricity much more efficiently than anything organic can, and therefore are used in our brain to do all the electrical wiring of our brain. We need to metallize ourselves by eating them. And 
where, where they come from ultimately from the soil. And so losing your soil is equivalent of losing the sun. You need both of them together. Civilizations who have not taken care of their soil because they have done crazy deforestation tend to die. I don't have the reference right now, but the name of the right now, I don't have the names right now, but the name of the book. It's a, it's a book called Top Soil and Civilization. You can just Google it. I'm sure that it's in Google Books because it's an old book. It's a fabulous book, which is the history of topsoil throughout all the civilizations, going back to Egypt and Mesopotamia. And the author showed how something like 70% of all cities in history have died once they lose their topsoil because of crazy deforestation of sloped terrain. You, you take out the trees, the roots stop grabbing and stabilizing the soil, erosion comes, whether it's wind erosion or it's rain erosion or it's all kind of water-based erosion, takes away that soil, leaving, leaving behind only the, 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 the bony, you know, that sedimentary rock that gets exposed. And cities died. But the authors of that book calculate that on average, cities throughout history have been able to pass their genes only 70 times, 70 generations, before they die from loss of topsoil. And this is this is even though the best way of protecting a slope, which is of course terracing it create horizontal rather than inclined planes. This terraces, the idea of creating terraces, perhaps even with a little thing here to prevent that soil, it's as old as the Phoenicians. They already knew how to protect slopes from erosion, but terracing was not widely adopted, and to this day there are areas of the world where you can still see the peasants planting on slopes as if Terracing had never been invented. So we have never really taken care of our topsoil. And topsoil is fundamental. That topsoil, there are no metals. Without those metals, neither our brains, nor our bones, nor our blood can function. So, another point that is worthwhile saying at this point. A temperate forest runs its nutrients, including its metals through the soil. In other words, when microorganisms disassemble the corpse of an animal, disassemble the corpse of a plant, whatever iron, whatever calcium, whatever copper, whatever metals are there in that plant and our animal gets re-injected into the soil. So when you deforest a temperate forest, and that's what Europe was, the soil is pretty good. But when you deforest a rainforest, when you destroy a rainforest, rainforests are so old that their microorganisms had already become symbiotic with the roots of trees, and they in fact re-inject minerals and, and metals directly into the roots, so that the nutrient cycles do not pass through the soil. This is why destruction of rainforest in the Amazon is so wasteful. You do get a piece of land, but it's a piece of relatively poor land, nutrient-poor land. Whereas what you're destroying thousand species of small insects, you never know the value that the DNA of those insects may have had, say, 30 years from now, when sequencing genomes becomes something that's instantaneous, and when we begin to find rare proteins and rare enzymes in, in, in tiny, humble uh, species of insects, you know, which are really a form of capital, which are being, of course, wasted by deforestation of the rainforest in exchange for a soil that is not even that productive. In the case of Europe, though, the soil left behind after the deforestation was very productive, so that was not, in that particular case, true. Before I erase this and I move on, let me just add one more term that we need here. Imagine that you are one of these plants with opportunistic reproductive strategies, and you are, you are somewhere over here, and you look at this piece of land. You're a plant, you're not going to look at it, but humor me. What would this piece of land look like to you if you are 
like a normos. Well, it would look like a volcano just exploded. It would look like a tsunami just destroyed everything. It would look like a fresh piece of land that's ready for you to recolonize it. In other words, the moment humans deforest and, and clear a piece of land to plant their plants, lichen, moss, and other plants with opportunistic reproductive strategies try to move in because it's their job, as their niche. They are trying to put the ecosystem back together. So we humans call those plants that try to move in the moment we clear, we call them weeds. But the term weed is not a biological term. There is no such thing as a species called weed or a family of a species called weeds. The term weed is a cultural term. It refers to any plant who tries to put the original ecosystem back together, who moves in and opportunistically begins to reproduce, and we have to, of course, weed them out. Part of what the farmers do here, particularly in the land that lays fallow, during the rotation period, you still have to work the land. You're not planting on it, but you have to weed them out. You have to weed out all the all the all the, all the plants that are just trying to do their job. Now finally, one more point. This can be considered an ecosystem, a very simplified ecosystem. Farmers are the, the, the primary producers. Urbanites, or the inhabitants of the urban town, are the consumers. And, well, in farmers, the team, or the assemblage farmers, domesticate plants, are the primary producers, these are the consumers, and in between, what we have is domesticated animals. Domesticated animals allow us to focus the biomass directly on the human species. Domesticated animals, and I'm not talking about pets, I'm talking about uh, farms, <coughs> cows, pigs, sheep, uh, goats, are literally biomass converters. Cows, for instance, can convert about 5% of what they eat that is non-humanly edible, that is cellulose, stems of plants, the roots of plants, the leaves of plants, which are entirely undigestible by humans, they can convert about 5% of that into flesh or milk. And therefore, they are converters. They are converting something that we cannot eat into something that we can eat. And therefore, they allow to focus that biomass that was going to go to waste or was going to be eaten by some other creature into humanity, into the primary consumers. Pigs are even more efficient biomass converters. They transform about, cows transform 5% of what they eat into flesh and milk. Pigs transform about 20% of what they eat into flesh. However, unlike cows, which at least back at that, at that time that ate mostly cellulose, today we feed grain to cows to get better steaks, and so this point is not valid for today, it's only valid for the time period of time that we're talking about right now. Uh, unlike those cows that transform on edible cellulose, pigs also eat carbohydrates, which are typically also good for human consumption. Nevertheless, pigs, so they are not as valuable to us as cows in terms of converters. Nevertheless, pigs can act as literally biomass storage devices. Think of a plentiful harvest that cannot be pickled, that, you know, the kind of grain that, that, that you can store for a year, a year and a half, two years max, and then it's going to go to waste. Well, instead, you feed it to pigs. Pigs live 10, 15 years, which basically means that all this food that was going to go to waste because it's excess food that no, no human could eat, you're feeding it to pigs, pigs are transforming it into their own flesh and storing it as ham, you know, bacon, and oh my god, I'm so hungry and other forms of edible biomass. So, this is important because what you have here is a conversion of a food web into literally a food pyramid. A pyramid with human beings at the top. Uh, 
what's, what's originally a fluid web with many nodes in a network has been transformed into a fluid pyramid with humans at the top. Farmers and domesticated plants at the bottom. Microorganisms have had human history, 
And he began a genre which continued with Alfred Crosby, and the latest addition to the genre is named Jared Diamond. You know, he, he has a book called uh, uh, Guns, Germs, and Steel that won the Pulitzer Prize just a few years ago. Uh, Jared Diamond is the, late, is the last in a series of historians that have, that have been using contemporary knowledge about ecology, projecting it to the past, Taking us, you know, using as much statistical data as we have about the past, but also projecting back ideas that we now have. Ideas about succession, about ideas about uh, the forms in which uh, the topsoil can be eroded, ideas about, uh, you know, where water comes from and how it can be polluted. All those ideas <coughs> can be now projected to the past because we know a lot about the chemistry of soils, we know a lot about the interaction between water and soil. We can begin to, to decipher what happened to seas in the past when they were careless ecologically. At any rate, Alfred Crosby, had in, in his book Ecological Imperialism, claims that the temperate areas of Particularly, you needed to unleash 
infectious diseases on them and kill a large percentage of the population before you could Christianize them and in a way digest them into the tissues of, 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 Euro of, of European cities. But these places were sparsely populated they, 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 whether there had been civilizations there before or not, it doesn't matter. At that point, they weren't anymore, and they were mostly hunter-gatherers uh, without metallurgical skills and so on. Which, in other words, it was it was it was a population vacuum in which people moved in the temperate areas. Of the so, so there was no need to think about intermarriage with the natives as there was in Mexico and Peru. You could simply put large amounts of, of white people into those areas to give these adventures staying power. So, in those temperate areas, the exact same circle within circles with a city and its countryside surrounding it began to, began to be reproduced. But I know other types of phenomena were interesting before we move on. Well, let me actually first say something about this. Between this five, the temperate areas of these five areas are the most photosynthetic, photosynthetically productive land in the world. This doesn't necessarily mean the availability of sunlight, just a raw sunlight, because clearly the tropics are very rich in sunlight. But the tropics, number one, are humid, and the fog I mean, a lot of that sunlight gets lost and it kind of bounces off or gets reabsorbed and it doesn't really hit the ground. Number two, in the tropics there are no long, long summers. In other words, the day remains roughly the same in length throughout the year. And the crops that the Europeans brought with them needed, on the other hand, very long summer days. So they, that can only happen away from the tropics, away from the equator on either side. Whether you're talking about Argentina or you're talking about the United States. So in these areas, there were the long, long summers that, that their crops needed. Plenty of uh, nutrients in the soil because again, in the tropics, the soils are so old and the bacteria so highly attuned and symbioticized with the roots that they that the nutrient cycles don't pass through the soil, so the soil has become very poor. There's also the question of tropical pests and diseases like malaria, yellow fever, that act as a kind of ecological barrier for the movement of people. So when the Euro Europeans took over these lands, they took over the most photosynthetically productive lands in the planet. Now that is taking over some supply zone. That is converting half of the world into a supply zone. And in a second, I'm going to tell you the second condition for that to happen. But before I do that, let me do one more thing. As Crosby says, not only humans moved into the new Europe's, also weeds moved into the new Europe's. European weeds had already co-evolved with cattle, with pigs, with, with goats and so on for 2,000, 3,000 years. So they had already evolved defenses against heavy grazing, heavy munching, heavy stepping on. In fact, they had already evolved that adaptation to take advantage of cows and, and, and pigs and so on as pollinators. Some weeds had seeds that had little hooks so they could Hitch a ride on the hide of a cow or on the hide of a pig. Others develop very tough shells so that they could survive the movement through the seven stomachs of a cow and eventually be deposited as manure somewhere else. In other words, they had co-evolved with cattle. <coughs> and for so many thousands, for 2,000, 3,000 years, that by now they were symbiotic with them. They used cattle. They, they could withstand the grazing by cattle and at the same time use cattle for their own propagation. So European weeds came in the stomachs of cows, came in the form of seeds, in a, in a, in a, in a shoe or in the wooden planks of a box that, that came with the ship, uh, you know, some provisions, some tools and so on. 
and began to win their own colonizing battles against local weeds. According to Crosby, in the northeast of the United States, there is hardly a single weed, that is a single plant with an opportunistic reproductive strategy, that is of local origin. And the reason why is this. All the local weeds had no idea what it was to deal with, what, with large, hairy bore quadrupeds. There was buffalo, of course, but that was farther west. On the east, most of large quadrupeds had already been pushed into extinction by the earlier human colonizers. In particular, all old, old horses were gone. There were no horses in the new world. So all those wild horses that you see in westerns were in fact European horses. I'm going to explain that in a second. So, European weeds had absolutely no problem taking over because the local weeds were totally disoriented once they began, they began to have cows and goats eating them and tramping them and so on. Before they could recover, European weeds had already moved to those patches of terrain that, that these weeds had left behind and began winning their own colonizing battles. Moreover, as Crosby shows, even fruit trees like peach trees and orange trees began to acquire weedy behavior in the sense that they began to reproduce by themselves like crazy. Native Americans living on the West Coast, even, even before they saw a European face, even though they before they saw any, any white person, they already saw oranges flowing in a river, you know, kind of half-bitten oranges and oranges that have fallen from the tree, but nevertheless, or peaches that they had never seen before. And to them, that was kind of the writing on the wall. You know, the, the art strangers coming. These fruits have never been here. You know, these are, they, we, have never, we haven't seen these strangers, but you can see the signs that they are coming. And the signs were fruits that the Europeans had brought in, fruit trees that had all of a sudden become wild again. The same thing happened to animals. An animal, of course, a cow or a pig, is kept the way it is, that is not wild, domesticated by selective breeding. But that selective breeding, that vigilance, you know, who the cow mates with and who the pig mates with every season, needs to be carefully controlled. The moment human vigilance falls, pigs, cows, horses go wild again. Oh, oh as it's called, go. Pigs, for instance, after four or five generations, they begin to grow tusks again. Their hair becomes wiry. Today, you know, our pigs are almost hairless. They begin to be covered with wiry hair again and grow larger in size and become what in Australia is called razorbacks. Which means, basically, that they were under our genetic control, but that genetic control had to be, had to be enforced day to day, if you want to, season to season. The moment that genetic control ceased, pigs became wild again, and they just went back to the original state. All we had done was repress certain traits that they had to juvenilize them, basically make them into kind of porky pigs, cute little pigs, but they can go back to their original state if you leave them alone, if they escape, for instance. The same thing can happen to cows, the same thing can happen to horses. In Argentina, large amounts of cattle escaped human control and became wild cattle roaming the countryside, sometimes even inhibiting human movement and human colonization by their large numbers. Horses I had a very interesting story too. I'm going to draw a map of North America, which is as cubist and badly drawn as my map of Europe. So you get to laugh, but only a little bit. That's Mexico, as you can see. That's Florida. That's the East Coast. Yeah. South America. This is the border of Mexico. 
course, the border used to be all the way up here until somebody stole half of our territory. But let's bygones be bygones. We're taking it back anyway. <laughs> So the story with horses is very interesting, as Mexico City. The Spanish conquistadors brought horses to America, of course, and moved them to, to ranches and, and, and farms and so on around Mexico City. A few of those horses went feral and began to reproduce, began to form herds, and horses are naturally a migratory species. So the horses began to migrate, began to migrate northwards. And here were settlements of Native Americans of different tribes. The horses began to flow through them. So Native Americans, again, before actually meeting a white person, were suddenly confronted not only now with oranges and peaches in the rivers, but with a new animal that they had never seen. Herds of this animal roaming through their territory. Prior to that flow of horses, most of these tribes you know, remember they had not mastered the arts of metallurgy, so their arrows were stone-tipped. And uh, they, that, they basically had a, a balance of power in terms of weapons. But horses are almost by nature war machines in the following sense. When you mount a horse, it doesn't matter what you have in your hand. Let's imagine that it's a broomstick. You, when you charge something with a horse, your arm, as long as you're tightly bound to the horse and holding this thing tightly, your hand inherits the momentum of the horse. That is the mass of the horse multiplied by its speed. Now we have momentum, because we have mass, and we can run at relatively fast speed, but we don't run nearly as fast as a horse does, we, and we don't nearly have the mass of a horse. So by the mere act of mounting a horse and holding something that you can hit people with on your hand, this broomstick becomes a weapon. Because when you hit something with it, you hit it with the full momentum of the horse. So when, if you are archers, as Native Americans were, then you are even in a better situation. You mount a horse and you now have mobile, missile throwing, cavalry, automatic so as this flow, as this flow of, of wild horses began to move northwards, a few of the Native American settlements, the Comanches, the Apaches, which perhaps were the more warlike, immediately saw the potential of the horse. They tamed them and they began mounting them and warring against other Native American tribes. Which basically means that we were upsetting their social ecosystem with this flow of escaped horses even before we conquered them militarily. When I say we, I mean we white people, we Europeans. Okay, so much more feral stuff. Now, Fine, so these plants have the most concentrated potential in the world. To this day, these five, the temperate areas of those five countries have the most food surpluses than anywhere else in the world. In other words, they produce food, they eat food, and they have the largest amount of food that's left after consumption. Therefore, are the largest food exporters, is particularly when it comes to grain, and in many in many cases, in many in cases of many countries, these temperate areas basically feed those countries. So taking them over was a masterpiece <coughs> because you are taking over not just any supply zones but the supply zones. However, as with all colonial adventures, there is one more element that you need in addition to domesticated plants and animals, and that is human numbers. The weight of demographic numbers. It's human, raw human violence. How many people are you sending there? Europe had already tried colonial adventures early on in the period that we we're studying, namely the Crusades. And they had, in fact, managed to conquer Jerusalem on at least one occasion. 
They just did not manage to send enough people there to hold the ground. So the colonial adventure did not have staying power. You can go somewhere, you can transform that somewhere into a supply zone, but 50 years later you're out. That's still a supply zone. It fed you for 50 years, but nevertheless, you're out. If you want to have staying power, you need to send massive amounts of people there and occupy that land with human numbers. There is no other way. Any other colonial adventure that did not have that second ingredient failed. It could be superior militarily than the locals and win, and win the battle the first day, but your occupation is not going to last unless you have the weight of demography, the weight of numbers. And this is what happened here. Between 1840 and World War I, 50 million people were exported to the New Europe. amount of people that has ever crossed the ocean and probably the largest amount of people that will ever cross the ocean in the sense that there is not that much empty land anymore for 50 million people to sell in. That was a one shot, one chance type of situation and Europe made the best, took the most advantage of immigration. Now immigration did two things. Crosby calls this, by the way, a Caucasian tsunami. And I think that's a very funny name. The Caucasian tsunami, most of the 50, 50 million people, something like 70% went to the United States and stayed there. 10% went to Argentina. Smaller percentages went to Australia and New Zealand. Gave these colonial adventures their staying power. And, and, and consolidate the transformation of the new Europe into supply zones for Europe. Because you know, this, many of these 15 million people were farmers, were peasants, were people who were going to be working in the land or engaged in industrial production, building the railroads, building the, 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 the rail system. But in addition, you're exporting 50 million hungry mammals. 50 million people that would have eaten your own food had they stayed in Europe. The, the Caucasian tsunami began with the hungry Irish, of course, when, you know, the potato, when they had the famous potato famine. But then came several waves of Germans, Swedes, yeah, towards the end Italians, Poles, and a, a, a variety of other peasantry, and, 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 uh, and from different destinations in Europe. And not only then Europe was consolidating its grip on the new Europe and therefore consolidating its grip on the supply zones, it was getting rid of 50 million hungry mouths that would have eaten its own food over there. The problem with the relationship between people and food at least before the advent of intensive agriculture, that's when agriculture is simply extensive. Ex the difference is this. Extensive agriculture, you produce more food by adding more land, not by increasing the productivity of existing land. It's called intensive agriculture. Extensive agriculture is simply adding more land in extension. Adding, it, 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 increasing the extension of the land that you're planting. When you practice extensive agriculture, you can add more land as need be. The problem is that human beings, the moment they have more than two kids in each, with three kids this already works, but four kids, five kids make it even worse, they don't add themselves up, they multiply themselves. You have three kids, each one of your three kids has three kids, each one of those three kids has three kids, and you're, you're actually following an exponential series. You're growing in a multiplicated way. But land, on 
unless you come up with a system of intensive agriculture, simply adds itself in an additive way. So land grows arithmetically, humans grow geometrically from the moment they have more than two kids. And of course, families back then used to be five, six, seven kids because people had to protect themselves against very high rates of infant mortality. We're going to talk about that next Monday when we talk about inoculation and vaccination and all that. You know, up to the late 1800s, seas in Europe were not net producers of people. You needed migrants from the countryside constantly flowing in just to break even because the rates of infant mortality were very high. We're going to be talking about that on Monday. But part of what the response by families to that fact was to have extra kids as protection. So if now we're talking about six kids per family, we're talking about an increase in hungry mouths that is tremendous. It doesn't really matter how much land you're adding unless you add intensive agriculture. Let's talk about that.
and therefore constituting, constituting a kind of economies of agglomeration in farm or in farm production. This is the very first attempt in modern European circles at creating a, a form of intensive agriculture. Because as I just said, extensive agriculture cannot keep up with human numbers. Extensive agriculture is additive, human numbers are multiplicated. So we needed, we needed to multiply the productivity of the land. And this was one way of doing it. So this is economies of agglomeration. Hundreds of farms. Small, but very sophisticated. As I said, the farmer was now at that, at that time an entrepreneur. He or she would keep informed as to what the prices are in the marketplace and would make decisions as to what to plant in the human food side of the thing. Depending on those and that information, therefore, these were not supply zones; these were businesses, owners of their own destiny. They were not; they were feeding other people, but they were profiting from feeding other people. They were not being kept in a state of underdevelopment on purpose. They were sophisticated entrepreneur farmers. Then. In the late 1700s, this became, this came to England, or it became the Norfolk system, based on economies of scale. Locating 
you know, since the British Navy had basically dominated the seas for a hundred or more years at that point, they were experts at creating blockades. They blockaded all ships coming from Chile going into Germany, and the Germans were forced in a few years to invent the synthesis of ammonia, that's to invent artificial fertilizers entering into World War I. But that just shows you the dangers of opening the nutrient cycles. Today, unfortunately, the Norfolk system is the one that is used in the United States. It's based on this large, large agro, as we might call that big business. It's economies of scale, and the, and, the, and the inputs to production now come from a handful of large corporations that own either oil on one hand, and therefore they can make fertilizer out of oil, they can make a, a, a insecticides and a, a herbicides out of the substances, and who have been buying little by little, this is true of, of corporations like Monsanto, seed companies. So that now they can either selectively breed those seeds or biotechnologically altering their genes so that farmers have to go back for seed every year. Right? Before that, you would plant some seed which was left, what was left from the previous harvest. You have a new harvest, you reap the harvest, you eat some of that seed, and then you keep some of the seed for planting the next harvest. Your seeds were reusable as they are in nature. But of course, Monsanto and other corporations don't want you to do that. They, they, for them, there is intellectual property at stake here. Just like, just like Microsoft compiles its operating system into a bunch of ones and zeros to protect its trade property, Monsanto doesn't want you to copy its seeds using natural means. So it engineers them whether through selective breeding or direct biotechnology, once they put a gene called the Terminator gene, that would, uh, I don't know who came up with the name, it was a public relations disaster way to happen, but um, nevertheless, it was a gene that was a switch. And in case a farmer did not come back for new seed to Monsanto, that switch would kick in and that seed would be made worthless. So, unlike the old system based on economies of agglomeration, which was just like Silicon Valley in the example this morning was resilient against downturns. Well, this is resilient against interruptions of the supply chain, interruptions of the flows of fertilizer and so on because it's self-contained. The Norfolk system, which eventually became the American system of big agro, is fragile, it's brittle. And it can be disrupted in a variety of ways. Worse yet, the farther selective breeding of vegetables and, 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 and grain and other, and other vegetable products is now being guided from the, from the processing end of the food chain. In places practicing the Norfolk system in the United States, for instance, in the 1930s and 40s, it is, uh, the breeders of plants like tomatoes began to collaborate with makers of farming equipment so as to select for genes in the tomatoes that, for instance, allow them to ripe at the same time. So that if you're going to apply routine machine work to the picking of the, of the, of the tomatoes, all of the tomatoes would be ripe at the same time so they could be machine pickable. And so genes began to be, or genes, for instance, began to be uh, selected in other plants so that they would survive the trip in, in a truck from the farm to the supermarket, or in the case of Campbell's soup, began to, to select for genes that would make for better uh, a, 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 a processed foods. Uh, McDonald's began to help the propagation of only certain genes of certain potatoes, a Burbank potato, because as a franchise, McDonald's forces you to use Burbank potatoes in all your chips. That's part of what a McDonald's French fry is supposed to be. And if you want to have a, 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 a franchise of McDonald's in, say, France or somewhere else, the contract says that you have to use Burbank potatoes. But that means that corporations are spreading the genes of certain plants and homogenizing gene pools. And again, 
the, the genes that are being selected are not necessarily the genes for better nutrition. They are the genes for better processing capacities, better processing quality, surviving the trip from the farm to the supermarket, maturing at the same time so that, in other words, adjusting the genetic basis of vegetables to the routine schedules of industry, which is precisely the kind of homogenization that we can expect from economies of scale. There's, of course, much more to be said about this. I'm going to stop right here. But we have one more flow of biomass to follow. As I said at the beginning of the class, the very first step in every food chain, and every terrestrial food chain anyway, is the production of sugars, chemical molecules with a very high capacity to store energy and to yield energy during digestion. Sugar, as, as we know it, you know, as a table product that we put tea, teaspoon, teaspoons full of it in our coffee and, and our cereal and so on, used to be, in fact, a rare product in Europe prior to 1800. It existed from sugar cane and from other sources, but it was rare, expensive, and it was, in fact, considered more of a medicinal type of stuff than a food stuff. At any rate, no one in 1800 considered sugar a, uh, a staple food, something that you, that you have to have as part of your everyday diet. But with the colonization of the Americas, in particular the Caribbean, we began to have slave plantations. Slave plantations signify the forced migration of 6,000 African Americans, 6,000, 6 million, Six million Africans, I can't write and talk at the same time today, six million Africans forced to migrate. So you can add those in terms of the movement of people that took place in those centuries to the 50 million Caucasians in the Caucasian tsunami that we just talked about. These six million Africans, of course, did not have nearly the same reproductive capacity as the Caucasians that came as part of 50 million. Whereas those Caucasians came in families and therefore would have four or five kids in the first generation, their kids would have four or five kids and they had multiplied their numbers many times in a few decades. The slaves brought to the colonies, or rather to the plantations, were heavily tilted towards the male, a male ratio, or a few females, but heavily tilted to the male ratio as we will see in another class, from different linguistic backgrounds so they could not communicate. And a slave plantation, it doesn't matter how, how you dress it, it's not a community. It's a mere artificial collocation of people from different backgrounds that do not really have a community life. We're going to talk about a little bit more about this when we talk about how African American English was born in another class. It was, it was created by slaves through a process of simplification and then creolized by re-enriching it later on as part of the need of these slaves to communicate with one another because they did not have any other choice. We're going to return to that in a minute. Nevertheless, I know although many of these six million people, not all of them produced food, many of them were producing pigments for the textile industry or all of them, others were producing cotton for the textile industry, Sugar plantations were big and using cheap slave labor, which means that suddenly an enormous flow of sugar, which had never existed before, started moving from America, from the Caribbean, towards Europe. And in about 70 years, the diets of, of every European, but in particular of working class Europeans, began to change to include sugar in a whole variety of ways. For the first time, you began adding sugar to your tea, and began adding sugar to your coffee, and began adding sugar to your bakeries, 
I mean, adding, adding sugar to just about everything that you could add sugar to. Sugar being produced by slave labor was cheap. And so it allowed to keep the wages of workers in England and other places relatively low. Therefore, they allowed for wage inflation not to eat the, the higher productivity of the Industrial Revolution. So if the Industrial Revolution really was just a business of steam engines producing cotton woods, which it was, that was the main business of the Industrial Revolution, in the background of the Industrial Revolution, there was a food revolution. Sugar had been added to the diets of working class people everywhere in Europe, slowly but surely, so that at the end of the 19th century, they were all eating relatively low price calories, which kept wages, I'm not sure that it completely depressed wages, but it certainly kept wages from becoming a wage spiral with the prices of food, which normally is what eats all the profits for, for corporations, and it allowed those profits to continue to concentrate and accumulate. So sugar was yet another flow of biomass that invaded Europe in those years and that changed the dietary habits and the customs of Europeans. Guys, I'm 15 minutes early, but basically, this is the end of the class. We can start the question and answer period a little earlier today. Before I do that, let me just say one more thing. The flow of biomass constitutes only one of the two main flows of materials that are of biological origin. The other flow is the flow of genes. The flow of genes through generations. Now it's a completely different flow. The flow of biomass flows through food chains. So it's a flow of matter that goes through mouths, gets chewed up, and then gets digested, and so on and so forth. The flow of genes is much slower. It only moves one tick every generation. However, it's a flow. It's a flow just like the flow of biomass. Now the flow of genes of domesticated animals, we have controlled it for about 10,000 years since the Neolithic Revolution. And so that is one that has already been part of this story. But there's another flow of genes that is very important, which is the flow of genes through microorganisms. And, uh, and that is a much faster flow of genes. Microorganisms can reproduce themselves every half an hour, every hour, every one day, every week, depending on the species, depending on the strain of bacteria, of virus, and they pass their genes with them which means that they evolve at a much faster rate than we evolve. So the evolution of microorganisms, specifically the evolution of infectious diseases, has been an important factor in the history of Europe, the United States, and other places in the fact has been a history, it has been a factor in the history of the whole world, but just staying within the framework of this class, it has had many different and very important effects on the history of seas, and on the history of the organizations that inhabit seas. So what we're going to do next Monday, and that's why it's very important that no one misses the class, is we're going to talk about William McNeil's history of humanity from the point of view of microorganisms, all the different forms of diseases, the, the role that diseases play, particularly in the colonization of Mexico and Peru, that is places that were packed with people, and that therefore were going to be almost impossible to colonize. But if you unleash epidemic diseases on them and exterminate, however unconsciously, you know, two-thirds of them, then the disoriented survivors are easy to digest into your own culture, are easy to Christianize, for instance, which is in fact what happened in Mexico and Peru. And we are also going to talk about uh, how, and this is a, a thesis by another historian, his name is Michel Foucault, how our encounters with certain epidemic diseases, in particular the bubonic plague, uh, shaped the way in which we built certain organizations by the 17th and 18th centuries. It changed the architectural form of hospitals, schools, factories, barracks, and prisons. These five types of organizations were one thing in the 1600s and an entirely th different thing by the 1800s. They had changed in architecture to become 
behavioral micros microscopes, that is, the architecture allowed light to penetrate so that you could actually observe and analyze the, the inhabitants of these buildings, whether they were students, patients, prisoners, workers, soldiers. And according to Michel Foucault, we learn how to do that from our confrontations with the plague a few centuries earlier. So then what we're going to cover on Monday is the second flow, biological flow that flows into cities, the flow of epidemic diseases. We're going to see how cities, in fact, are epidemiological laboratories in the sense that only in places where there's a high enough density of people can certain diseases persist and evolve. And that density doesn't occur in rural villages. In density, remember what it means. How many people can you pack in a certain amount of space? How tightly packed are people in a certain amount of space? The tighter they're packed, the easier it is for certain diseases to transmit from one another. And I'm going to give you all the details on Monday. And the easier it is for that disease to become a specifically urban disease. And that's, that's important in the context of today's class because today we saw two things. When I drew that town surrounded by a forest, and I said that the moment you clear the forest, plants with opportunistic reproductive strategies try to move in. That is, weeds move in. What I was saying is that the line between nature and culture, before you take your guns out, Nature and culture are rarefied generalities. So I'm just I'm putting them in quotes right now. Protected, protection quotes. Weeds move in, which means that the line between nature and culture, or the line, better, before someone actually starts shooting here, the line between urban ecosystems and natural ecosystems has to be kept sharp by weeding them out whether by hand or by spraying them with herbicides. So that the line between nature and culture is never sharp. It's only kept as sharp as humans keep it on a day-to-day -day basis. The existence of fear of animals also confirms this. Our control over domesticated animals is only as good as our day-to-day -day surveillance of their gene flow. The moment that surveillance stops because they escaped, uh, like the horses that we were talking about before, and they begin migrating on their own, well, they are not under human control anymore. They go wild again, which means they cross the line between culture and nature back into nature. That is going to be an important subject next week because next week we're going to be talking, I mean, yeah, next Monday, because we're going to be talking about certain diseases that are specifically urban. Diseases that cannot survive in a rural environment, which means that even at the level of microorganisms, we coexist with, you know, with nature, even within our own cities. Because this, as, and I'm going to give you the details next Monday. These microorganisms are specific, they're called the diseases of civilization par excellence. For the first time I heard that. There would be microorganisms that would be specifically designed to survive urban centers. I was blown away because that immediately began to tell me, well, then the line between nature and culture is very fuzzy. In fact, at the level of at the microscopic level of bacteria and viruses, it almost doesn't exist. And that is, at any rate, what we're going to be discussing on Monday. Okay? So if this class is called Citizens Ecosystems. Next Monday, we're going to do cities as epidemiological laboratories. Okay, and that will be the second part of the biology of cities part of the class. Well, with that extra few words, I only want to get before a clock. And now I'll take a breather and think of a very clever question. <laughs> Let us go, man. We're like long winded.
from European experience. In Europe, these are roughly the numbers. Numbers, numbers of people, numbers increased, human numbers increased between 1100 and 1350, between 1450 and 1550, and between 1750 and 2000, and they continue to grow. Numbers decrease, human numbers, between 1350 and 1450. This is part, partly because of the bubonic plague, partly because of the own ecological crisis that crazy deforestation had caused, and 1650, 1750. Now, when the numbers decrease in Europe, all those predators that we had excluded from our food chains, including wolves and bears, would come back. That's where actually the, the, the story of uh, you know little red hood, uh, riding hood, or whatever comes from. In, four, in, the, in the early 1400s, there are several accounts of wolves entering Paris and like kind of grabbing children from their mothers, you know, entering through the gates, and then people would go try to call the police. You know, there's, there's wolves at the gates. You know, meanwhile, a couple of children had already eaten. And stuff like that. And so Europeans have that in their memory. I'm not saying that Francois in particular, but it is part of their history, part of their memory, that the moment, the moment their numbers decreased, they couldn't hold on to their own land. And that, that just made them aware at a very, and of course it's now recorded in folk tales, like little right, the red writing hood or whatever the name of the tale is. It's, it's recorded in folk tales. And so it's now part of their memory that without those numbers, nature comes back, and nature is not always, you know, flowers and bees and birds, right? It's wolves, it's bears, it's predators. Not to mention nature in the form of bubonic plague, you know, the rats carrying fleas carrying bubonic plague that killed a third of Europe. But even without that, even if your numbers just decrease because you have a low fertility rate, you know that nature is going to make a comeback and it's going to be perhaps nasty nature. Not so much because it's nasty, but because it's going to try to recomplexify those food chains that we have shortened and slimmed down and redirected only to humans. New things try to plug in into those food chains and they threaten our control of the food chain. So part of what he may be talking about is is, is that is that history that's coded into their own history. Right. This is an interesting period, by the way, 1650, 1750, because it's called the Little Ice Age. Different historians time it differently, so I'm using here Brodell's own number. This was a cooling period that still nobody knows how to explain, except for the fact that we know that it occurred throughout the world, China had a little ice age, uh, India had a little ice age at the same time. So it, it has to be something like a jet stream. It has to be a climatic structure that's global. So it cannot be you know, the trade winds or the monsoon or anything that is only kind of specific for a local region. It has to be some air current or some major part of the climate system that spans the globe. We don't know yet what happened. There are a few models that try to explain how the jet stream could have changed. But everything got several degrees lower that had all kinds of consequences. Harvests began to fail. Famines, which used to be only local famines, have always existed. You know, towns starving because they have bad harvest and they cannot be reached in time. But now harvest became general. Entire regions were dying of hunger. When you have general famines, the most important taboo in the flow of biomass, you shall not eat other human beings, is actually violated. Just like it's violated when a soccer team lands in the, you know, in the Andes and, 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 and they see the yummy little butts of their dead uh, you know, uh, playmates and go, well, he wasn't even that good at soccer. <laughs> you know, let's get a few slices of ham out of his ass. <laughs> Was practiced in Europe during the Little Ice Age. In 
certain isolated places, right? But that's a huge taboo to break. I mean, once you meet another human being, it's very hard to live with yourself. Nevertheless, it shows you the power of, you know, the, the, the limited power of taboos. Something like a little ice age, ice age is unleashed. And, and in a less drastic way, I mean, that was, I began with the most drastic example, I should have said that for the end. Uh, potatoes, which had spread to Iran, Ireland, and, you know, potatoes come from the New World, so they were a, 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 a Mexican gift to, to, to Europe. Uh, the, the Irish took to them immediately, but the French didn't. The French had some kind of taboo against food that is underground, you know, it's like in touch with the devil or, you know, Satan is like touching it or something like that. It's like that five second rule when you drop a can here or here, and it's like a five second rule, like one, two, three, four, five. Yeah, yeah, that's terrible. So here, the five second rule was totally broken because the potatoes come from underground. The French would not eat it. On the little ice age, they would be making French fries like there's not tomorrow, you know. So, what I like about this period, and there's a fabulous, uh, a fabulous uh, documentary on the History Channel, by the way, those new type of documentaries with uh, enact the scenes and everything about the little ice age has all kinds of different consequences. It's precisely because it tests the strength of human taboos, right? Yes, we, we code food. Yeah, right? Fish becomes the sacred food for Lent. Uh, or you cannot eat uh, 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 meat in, during Lent, you know, if you're a Catholic anyway. Uh, and, and so on. Pork becomes taboo for, for Jewish religions or for Islamic religions. So we, we do add a layer, a symbolic layer of language on top of food. Which, which codifies food and makes certain foods be taboo, certain foods be sacred, certain foods be ordinary. But the moment you have general famines, all those taboos go out the window. And so it's a kind of a reassertion of the materiality of the world, you know, against the purely symbolic layers, which are relatively superficial. They do control our lives, and we do follow diets, particularly if you're a religious person. The moment something that little ice age hits, you know, you start throwing all those stuffs out the window. This has become, by the way, and this is a separate subject, but I'm going to mention it anyway, has become a topic again because we don't know exactly when it ended. There are some people who claim that it in fact went all the way to 1850. Now imagine if those people are right. 1850 is roughly the, the time where we get reliable statistics kept by governments about the climate. And therefore, those are the statistics that we are using to say that climate has been warming up in this century, right? So that climate you know, has warmed four degrees in the 20th century, right? Well, how do we know? Well, we're comparing average temperatures today with all this data, the reliable data that we have from roughly from 1850. Governments began to keep those data. Now, imagine that those guys are right. And the ice, the little ice age did not end until 1850. Well, that means that our base data is artificially cold. And therefore, we haven't really warmed up the planet that much. Right? It just seems that we have warmed it, but because we started from an artificially low point, we are right now just like basically, you know, it might not be the emissions of carbon dioxide, it's simply be the end of the little ice age that just took longer to, to, to end. Now, I don't happen to believe that is true, but there are people who happen to believe it's true. And, and this is one of the arguments they're using today against the whole taking drastic measures against global warming. Global warming, as anyone in the military will tell you, has to be approached as a worst case scenario. Just like in the military, you plan for a worst case scenario, and you have some kind of backup plan in case all of your troops get killed the first day of battle. You have to treat global warming like that. It's the worst case, it may, it may not come to pass, but if it does come to pass, the, 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 the consequences are so catastrophic in terms of everything. Malaria would move northward. All kinds of tropical diseases would move northward. It, 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 there would be a flooding of uh, many coastal areas. Uh, there's all kinds of the, the, uh, the Gulf Stream, which warns Europe could, could stop if there's enough fresh water near the, 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 uh, the place where it goes down. It goes down because there's plenty of salt in it. 
force it to go down, fresh water from the melted glaciers can reduce the, the degree of salinity to a critical point where the Gulf Stream stops. The Gulf Stream stops, and Europe becomes as cold as Canada. And, and you can see Canada is not very densely populated because of its climate, and yet Europe has much more people in it, and they would have to migrate somewhere else. So there's all kinds of consequences that have to be assumed, and so, but I mention it because this little ice age has become fashionable again as part of the discussion of global warming. But as far as your question goes, it is the weight of human numbers that keeps nature at bay. Our numbers reduce, nature comes back. And it comes back sometimes in nasty ways. So I assume part, you know, part of what he has in mind is this kind of European memory of, of, of times when times were bad. Times are bad, walls come back, right? And so, so you don't have that attitude. And, and also when they deforested Europe in the first part of the millennium, they did it. They actually did believe that it was inhabited by, by demons and that it was like, you know, there were monks, there were entire sects of monks whose, 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 whose job and, and a promise to God was every tree we, we fall is a, is a tree fallen for God. I mean, there are attitudes that we don't have here. Well, part of it, I, I think, is a criticism against the, um, the other way. Fix the problem, one well, then it must be 
our own sinners, and so who are independent women, any kind of independent women in town, I mean, that we're not necessarily in any way witches, but that we're not willing to, to kind of like bow down to men. That sin is burning at the stake. I don't know how many women were burned at the stake in that era. So it intensified revengeful behavior that was there anyway and that could have possibly occurred given other excuses because they gave a religious interpretation to, to, the, to the little ice age. They, they are failing and we are starving because God is angry. And so we need now to, to please God by killing the people that are offending him. Independent minded women, Jews, people from other uh, religions. It was an ugly period in the history of Europe, particularly away from large cities in the, in the, in the smaller places, which were more, even more kind of a, uh, superstitious about this. I'm wondering if the um, current economic recession or downturn could be described as a, in the same way as a little ice age. So instead of a reduction in energy of, of temperature, maybe it's a reduction in terms of money of flows of things. And therefore, could one begin to think about sort of certain actions that that's eventuated as being breaking of taboos and, and sort of cannibalistic activity. In particular, I'm wondering like, sort of like the United Kingdom selling off its commercial assets to Asia as a sort of a sacrificing thing, like rovers. It's an interesting observation, yeah. I never thought about it, but the metaphor is very appropriate. For one thing, what happened when it during the financial crisis, the first few days when Lehman Brothers collapsed, right, was a failure of liquidity, which, which basically meant that money stopped flowing. You had something that flowed, like in this case energy or food, in this case you had another flow, the flow of money, the flow of credit, that dried up from one night to the next, and that literally froze the financial system as if it was an ice age. It was, it was a I mean, that's, the metaphor is very appropriate. So, so I'm, I'm glad that you bring it up. I never actually thought about it that way. And you're absolutely right. The, sort of like what happened in, you know, here in the United States too, in New York, you know, uh, in, the, in, the, in the 70s, and particularly during the 80s when they began selling at Rockefeller's, you know, certain buildings in Rockefeller Center to the Japanese, or, they, or when Sony acquired uh, uh, Columbia Pictures, you know, the first time that we saw the first wave of big acquisitions by Japan in which landmarks, both architectural landmarks and industrial landmarks like Columbia Pictures were changing hands, and people began to see that as a kind of, you know, as a kind of, your, your, as a kind of human sacrifice to appease the gods. Of course, it's not that way, but it was produced by frozen liquidity, right? by frozen flows of money. Today, the example is very appropriate, and obviously it hit certain cities particularly hard, like London. Any city that was specialized on finance, like Dubai and London, was hit particularly hard. And so it is not uh, at all surprising that, there's, that, that, they, that certain taboos against selling you know, landmarks of, of, in London to, to, to foreigners can be completely forgotten because of the famine of money, you know, a kind of credit famine that followed that. So yeah, it's a very appropriate uh, comparison. We're talking about flows and what's, what, what happens when flows suddenly cease to circulate and the kind of taboos that are maintained when, the, when everything flows nicely and that are kind of like thrown away the moment survival knocks at your door. So the thing is, it's not just a case of selling, in the case of the UK, of selling buildings, but actually selling bits of industry. So the car industry just gets sold as, a, as an entire entity to, to Asia. And so it's not just a case of you're losing a building that you could build another one. Right. You're that's actually, kind of symbolic. That's the symbol. Something. But this is actually, you're, you're, you are literally getting rid of your arm. You're eating your arm. And you've no longer got your arm. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree with you. I mean, as long as the factories remain in England, it's hard to tell whether mere ownership by, say, the Japanese or by the Chinese or by the Indian, by, 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 by the Indians, 
is that dangerous because you know, your loss of manufacturing power becomes important, for instance, during a war, when you cannot produce your own armament again. You're outsourcing everything, so now all manufacturing power is outside your country. You, as you start a war, you cannot, it's sort of like opening the nutrient flows, you know, when we were talking about, you keep them closed, you keep them local, you keep them within an area, you are much more robust. You open them up so that now, you know, fertilizers come from far away and so on. A war that cuts off those flows immediately cuts you off from, from, from needed supplies. So in this particular case, manufacturing capacity is absolutely necessary when you have a war. Nations without it, nations who import all their weapons, like say Iraq, lose wars inevitably because their their armament gets degraded during the war. They run out of ammo, they run out of spare parts, and if they, they don't have an arms industry or at least a manufacturing industry that they can convert into arms manufacturing from one day to the next or from one day to the next, they are not going to be able to have any kind of staying power during a war. And so. As long as uh, if foreigners buy factories or keep them running in your country, that is not that much of a big problem in the sense that the state takes over those factories anyway during wartime. Whether, they, whether the new owners cooperate or not, there's always eminent domain, right? An eminent domain is, is, is something, you know, the absolute power of government to decide how a piece of land is going to be used or how a factory is going to be used. So eminent domain would mean that, that the manufacturing prowess stay there, the capacity stay there, it's only the formal ownership that has changed hands. Nevertheless, so, so, so it's less bad than, say, sending your manufacturing overseas. Because we said, we were talking about this morning, skills are transmitted by doing, right? They're, they're taught by example, they are learned by practice. Two generations without that practice, because now you're outsourcing everything, well, you're enriching other parts of the world with those skills, and you are depriving yourselves of human capital. For as long as they remain in, those skills remain in England, so they are still manufacturing cars, even if they are, who, who bought a Rover, Land Rover? It was a Tata Motors, or was it India? No, it was Chinese. It was the Chinese, the Chinese corporation. For as long as uh, that factory remains in England, the skills remain. It's just a form of ownership that changes. So I would say that. Yeah. Well, well, in this case, they, they took everything. They literally packed up the factory. Oh, they and, 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 and shipped, shipped them all. Yeah, no, that's a problem. And they took all the intellectual property rights. So there's complete sort of cannibalization. Yeah, well, that, <laughs> it's like using a limb. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah no, England is gonna regret that. Mm. I mean, I'm not sure they have a choice right now because, I mean, they are in a hole at the budget, their, their banks were heavily invested into this uh, securitized mortgages and a lot of the toxic assets remain in, in, in British banks, in addition to many American banks and so on. So I'm not sure how much of a choice they have right now. I mean, there are riots right now in London, right, over, over the cuts in, 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 in budget and so on. So I'm not sure what, what kind of choice they have, but it is the kind of thing they will come to regret. Particularly, if there's a war. When, when you all of a sudden realize that you cannot sustain a war, that you are now importing everything and all the skills necessary to, to manufacture armament, ammunition, equipment, and so on, are now gone. Right? So you have become, you have made yourself vulnerable at a level at which the British Empire would have never allowed itself to be. Right? I mean, they, they kept the manufacturing of ships, all the knowledge about you know, how to, how, to, how to build a navy, how to run a navy, how to equip a navy, was English, right? And that's how they dominated the oceans for so, many, for so long. You begin losing that, and I'm not exactly sure what, uh, what, what kind of future you can have. Again, <coughs> when the going gets tough, right? When, when, when and, and the, going, the going gets tough when there is, of course, warfare. But that's a good point. It, it's a very good simile. They are really cannibalizing themselves in a kind of financial little ice age. Hope, let's hope that I'm right and that the contra-tier cycle does exist. And I happen to believe it does because I, I've seen the stock market how fast it bounced. I mean, I think that the recession is going to be a shallow recession. And as long as the 
budget cuts don't choke the recovery, which is a problem when right-wingers take over government and they mindlessly begin, you know, Republicans want to do that right now, right? They had a 61 billion, 61 billion, cut, 61 billion cut in the, in the new budget, which Obama will never sign, but nevertheless they have to placate their base with those big numbers. You cut 61 billion from public expenses right now, you choke the recovery. So let's hope that they don't listen to them. In England, unfortunately, is the Liberal Democrats now in alliance with the Conservatives. So, so, so it's, I don't know what's going to happen in terms of they should know that this is not the time to start cutting. Someone has to deal with the public debt. Once you're out of the recession, not when you're kind of clawing your way out, it's like throwing a big bucket of water, you know, frozen water on. Mm -hmm. So uh, let's hope they come back to their senses. Yes? So it goes along with that, but um, I understand that when you start outsourcing certain production and manufacturing, you know, your resources become, so, become attenuated for purposes of war and everything. But isn't there a certain, um, when you're outsourcing, I guess, this idea of economies of scale, and um, does it then allow the, play, the, the citizens to, to start becoming more skilled? Because you, you then have less need for people to do repetitive work and more, there's yes, more advantages what, to that? If what you're exploring is routine work, yes. Mm -hmm. Right, I mean, you are, Exporting routinization, for instance, uh, uh, call answering centers, right, which is basically a routine. We're talking about this about this morning. As long as you're exporting routine work, the damage is not that bad because that routine work was degrading your skills at home anyway. So you're now kind of freeing a bunch of uh, you know you're freeing a bunch of people that would end up in those jobs to start doing I don't know new Twitter things or new uh, you know software things to be for that. Also, you also have a, a much larger services industry. So you're not manufacturing that much, but you're providing medical services, which are important in the sense that tons of people come to the United States to have you know a hard bypasses and, 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 and certain tricky operations. You know, the United States makes a lot of money offering medical services engineering services, legal services, and so on. All those can expand, and, and all, most of them do depend on skilled labor. So yes, you can compensate for the loss of routine manufacturing jobs by, the, by a, a kind of growth in the service industry, although, of course, the service industry also means flipping burgers and chickens and uh, McDonald's and, uh, 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 you know, Kentucky Fried Chicken, which is not exactly the most skillful of activities. Uh, so those jobs might also multiply kind of dumbing down your youth, right? But again, when it comes to hardware, and war is the ultimate test of hardware, we're going to have a whole class of warfare, so that's why I'm not, I'm not giving any examples right now, I don't want to cannibalize my own class, but when it comes to war, hardware becomes essential. I mean, it doesn't matter the, the software that you put in that drones and artificial intelligence for intelligent weapons and so on. Ultimately, war is about hardware and who can manufacture it fastest during wartime. If you have lost your manufacturing base and now you depend on a bunch of other people who are not reliable, who may, for all you care, ally with your enemy during a war, then you're not going to be able to sustain a war. And so, when it comes to, to clashes between hardware, between the hardware of two countries, that's when you begin realizing that you neglected an area of the economy that was very important. On the other hand, of course, in the future, a lot of uh, warfare is going to be cyber warfare. Right? It's going to be who hacks the other guys first, who, who destroys their communication and control systems faster. Who, who uh, breaks their cryptography codes and their firewalls and their as well, faster. And that might be the kind of ability that is growing in Europe and the United States, so far anyway. Although apparently the Chinese, the, the Russians and so on are getting there also pretty fast, right? I mean, there, there, there's been 
cyber warfare between Russia and its ex-colonies, right, Ukraine and so on, already well-documented cases of complete blockage of the internet by Russian hackers. So obviously they're not doing that bad. And uh, we know now of a couple of episodes of Chinese uh, cyber warfare in the United States, not necessarily the government, but by hackers. So, so, so that's another arms race. Right? There's, there's now hardware arms races and software arms races. So, so the issue is not that easy to decide. What was that? <laughs> Sort of like we have our missiles pointing at you. <laughs> That's right. Yes. Um, that gentleman was talking about the, the national security issues. I'm asking you further. You see, I'm just aware of the nation had to organize, but at the same time resist the economic scare worldwide. So, if, and further, if we understand the, the nation as awareness of historic individuals, is that awareness of historic individuals organized and resist at the same time the economic scares? So, uh, let me see if I understand your question. <clears throat> People who, who, who are born in the United States, who uh, believe themselves Americans, who are loyal Americans, who read them, history books and worship the, the, the founding fathers and the constitution and so on, who would want instinctively to defend their country, could see outsourcing, for instance, as a kind of national security issue, right? And, 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 and respond to it as if you were, say, also throwing your uh, frontiers open. Like everybody without a passport can come in, right? Which would be obviously a threat to national security because who the hell knows what, who, what people, you know, you need to fall these your frontiers one way or another. So, just like people respond to the crazy or the lack of vigilance at the frontier, worrying about it, people should feel worried about outsourcing, right? To the extent that we're losing, to the extent that this country is losing its manufacturing capacity and therefore its ability to wage war in the future. I would say that it should be that way. I mean, you know, normally people, when you ask them about outsourcing, they, they are against it because therefore we're exporting American jobs. In other words, they are, they are taking a very short-term version of the thing. They're going, well, if, if those jobs are going to India, if those jobs are going to China, <coughs> if going to Vietnam, that means that there's going to be less jobs here for me and for my kids. But I bet you that if we took that same people and gave them a, a, a history lesson as to how war has been decided by a country with the most manufacturing capabilities and how the United States is in a way surrendering future wars already by decreasing its manufacturing capability, they would think of it as a national issue. They would stop thinking about outsourcing as I'm going to lose my job and they would start thinking about the country as a whole, is losing its capacity to defend itself, you know. But for instance, in the issue of the food supply, I know China is like very concerned about how we can supply its food by its own country. Mm -hmm. you know, so even there is some opportunity to get food from the abroad, but still considered as a national security issue. So it is a national security yeah, issue. Yeah, so in that way, the understanding of the national security or the definition of the national countryside is resist the economic economics of scare happening worldwide. Yeah, no, I mean that's why that's why people with good reason, some writers have thought of you know, multinational corporations as being toxic for the survival of the nation state or of any kind of organized countrywide system because they first of all they have the mobility to they don't need to be in any one country anymore right? they, they can take their stuff and go somewhere else you tax me too much I'll go somewhere else that was one of the costs that we talked this morning about economies of scale because they vertically integrate things they horizontally integrate things they are self-sufficient they can move so it would be in the national security of, of countries to have economies of acceleration Many to see as many areas with small businesses because of <coughs> businesses cannot go anywhere. So they have to 
stay here nourishing the, the, the country. And the same thing with the food supply. I'm glad that you brought it up because obviously it's the subject of today's class. And I was not even mentioning that in the remarks that I was making right now. Absolutely. People, countries, particularly in times of war, need to be able to feed themselves because the very first thing your enemy is going to look at is your food supplies. It's going to be fertilizer, it's going to be insecticide and herbicide supplies, <coughs> it's, going to, it's going to interdict uh, energy supplies, fossil fuel, uh, gasoline, processed uh, diesel, and so on. The first chapter on every war is logistics. You know, how to interdict the logistics supply chains to a country. And then you destroy their armies. So they were, it's like they're doing in Libya right now. The very first thing they did is to in, it's called interdiction. They isolated all the frontline forces from the supply lines. So now, if you want to back, back off, you know, back off and we won't kill you. But right now you cannot advance anymore because your supply lines are cut. So the, the Allies in Libya did what a good military should do first choke all those flows that come into a country. And therefore, it pays for a country to be self-sufficient, at least in food supplies. Food and water. We have not even talked about water, but that's another, that's another issue that's very important. Particularly in areas like California, you know, where you have to be stealing the water from somebody else, the Colorado River, or some other people, because this is a desert. It's, 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 it's not supposed to have like palm trees and gardens and stuff like that. It's supposed to be a desert. And it has a lot of greenery thanks to all that water that comes. Now, in this case, it's coming from another state within the same country. But think about the Middle East, where several states share the Nile, or several states share a particular river. You know, a river can become something geopolitical from one state to the next. Whether because upstream they're polluting it and sending pollution down downstream, or because it can cut your water supply to the dam or something. <coughs> Water can also become geopolitical. And yes, food, and this is why, going back to the diagram I had there, it would be much better for the United States or China or any other country to, 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 to explore economies of agglomeration in their food supply. Thousands of small farms, very highly efficient, even computerized, but small, in which the nutrient cycles are kept closed. Because even with the best intentions, Remember there was such a, this thing called the Green Revolution of the 1960s, which was started with the best intentions. It was, let's make India and Mexico self-sufficient in their food supplies. So they began with, you know, by, by breeding varieties of corn, varieties of wheat, which like I said before, the, the, the genes are manipulated so that more, most, more of the biomass goes to the human edible stuff and less to the leaves and, and, and stem that get wasted. Then, they bought, unfortunately, they did not keep the nutrient cycles closed. They imported fertilizer, you know, they, were for, they, they needed lots of fertilizer that came from, from, from abroad, and favored economies of scale, they were, uh, favored irrigation systems, for instance. They were too expensive for small farms to put, so it favored large owners, large landowners, Everything was going well up to the early 70s, up to 1973 when OPEC, the, the oil cartel, suddenly changed the markup for oil, right? Because they are an oligopoly, they are a cartel, they have costs, so they can just add a markup, and the markup can be anything they want to. But they changed the markup. Oil prices skyrocketed. We had our first oil crisis of the modern period. And the very first thing that, that increased in price tremendously was fertilizers, insecticides, herbicides, and all the other things that are manufactured out of oil, not necessarily gasoline itself, but all the things that are manufactured from oil, and the Green Revolution collapsed. Right? So something that was started with a, with, a very, with a very nice intention of making Mexico and India self-sufficient ended up consolidating land ownership in a few hands, depending too much on economies of scale, large irrigation schemes, and opening the nutrient cycle so that anything that in <coughs> those cost of prices, they became, they made Mexico and India more fragile instead of more resilient. Bad news. And the, and the reason why was they did not take into account the hidden costs of economies of scale. 
So I would say that something similar should be happening. Someone should be arguing this in China. So in fact, as intellectuals, if the Chinese government wants to be self-sufficient in, 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 in food, do not create incredibly large rice paddies and, and, and do not depend on economies of scale that with open nutrient cycles. Reduce everything in, in scale and have a lot of farmer entrepreneurs running the system, not large-scale managers. Unfortunately, the communist system in general, not only in China, but in the Soviet Union and so on, has always been geared to slow, towards large scale. We talked this morning about Taylorism, you know, the routine, the scientific routinization of labor. When Lenin took over Soviet Russia, one of his famous statements was, well, the only good thing that we're going to keep from capitalism is scientific management. Because that is, it's more, it's more enlightened contribution to the future of humanity. Notice he did not understand that Taylorism degrades skills and that therefore has hidden costs in terms of human capital, which ended up being paid by the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union, as long as he was raised to the moon, or how many tanks can you build was impressive. But when it came to how many entrepreneurs do you have, how many people can design an iPod, how many people can design a computer, how many people can write software, it began to lose abilities, generation after generation, for welcoming Taylorism. So that is something that's built in into the socialist ideology, the idea that scale is good. The only bad thing is the ownership of the means of production. Take away the ownership of the capitalist, make the, the, the state the owner, and everything gets, is better. On the contrary, right, it makes it more fragile. Yes? Yeah, I mean, you're, we're starting to see a lot of this problems of economies of scale, especially the concentration of like, how food is grown, like, especially with the food shortage of the Egypt, including all this unrest. Um, what do you think about? The ideas of um, <coughs> farms and uh, polyculture that some people talk about that kind of come around for sort of like this whole monoculture, you know, giant farming being done in a very intensive way. And, and sort of, you know, what, what do you think of those? Well, it's obviously a very good idea. I mean, this has already, there has been several times in the United States. In the, in the, in the 20th century of the United States, where we almost lost our entire food supply to a single fungus or a single disease. The story goes like this. In the late 19th century, certain government organizations called agricultural stations or laboratories, I can't remember right now the name, began to create what is called hybrid corn and hybrid wheat. Now, hybrid corn, basically what you do is this, you, you do you, you do a selective breeding of a plant to create, for instance, that, that, the, that, the, that the fruit is larger. And, it, and but of course, it's going to have some bad traits, you know, like there's like chihuahua dogs are like, you know, they, they can hardly defend themselves. You know, there's like a chihuahua dog syndrome in the food, right? You create in another line that has another chihuahua dog problem, but it's also has some, some good stuff. And then you blend the two. That's the hybrid part of the hybrid corn that gets rid of the bad chihuahua dog uh, traits and leaves only the good traits. The problem is, when you then begin cloning, those are, those are fabulous plants. Everybody should have those plants, but not clones from those plants. Because if you clone them, as in fact they did in the United States, and all of a sudden the entire corn belt is, 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 is seeded or, or planted with clones, meaning plants with an identical genome, the moment a fungus, the moment a bacteria that finds a genetic window is going to destroy your entire crop, right? I mean, that is the problem with monocultures. Monocultures attract viruses. Monocultures attract, it's not that they attract them, they leave the door open. Variation in nature, polycultures, you know, allowing, not only, not only are you becoming more fragile because single disease can kill all the, all the clones, you begin losing those genes. You, you know, the, all the indigenous corn genes, all the indigenous wheat genes and so on that existed in this country are now gone because they were displaced by the much 
much more productive varieties that were being produced by the hybrid corn guys. Which is why Bush father never signed the treaty. You know, there was a treaty in his in his time. It, it, it was uh, the nations got together in Brazil. The idea that you could not go to another country and bring plants to your country. <coughs> Bush father refused to sign that treaty because he knows that first world countries are now gene poor. We have lost a lot of the gene variety, a lot of the wealth in terms of heterogeneity and variety in the genes. And so, so you want to leave the door open for, you know, re-enriching the gene supply with varieties from other countries that you may just go and, 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 and steal. So that whole treaty that was supposed to regulate the, the flow of genes from one country to another was not signed by the United States because they know they are gene poor. And that is another, another problem with monocultures. Right? So the, uh, in, the, in, the 90, in the early 70s, there was a big scare in which a single fungus that attacked uh, corn, attacked the entire corn belt, and almost destroyed the whole harvest. Prices in Chicago, you know, Chicago's a commodities market, went up like crazy. People began speculating with corn prices, and it was just a lucky change in the weather that stopped the fungus from propagating farther and killing the whole, the whole monoculture. So since then, there has been a lot more awareness about the protective value of genetic variety, about the idea that you cannot plant clones in enormous areas because that automatically makes it you're becoming brittle. Interestingly enough, in all the areas that have nothing to do with food, such as operating systems, when you have a monoculture of Windows machines, you also attract viruses, right? For a long time, people didn't write virus for the Macs. Macs were so, you know, they, they only a few graphic designers in the world have Macs. Who wants to attack them? Let's write viruses for Windows. And let's, let's write viruses for, you know, for Explorer. And it was like everybody attacking Windows because that's where the fun is. There's a monoculture of operating systems around, so that's where all the cyber viruses and cyber diseases that have expanded. Today is, of course, different because now the Mac has recovered a little bit, but that also became obvious within organizations that you have all your computers running the same operating system and the same software, left them open to attacks by, by viruses. Guys, I'll let you...